Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your hosts, Jim Person and Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Well, hello, Knife Junkies, and welcome to episode number 150 of the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Jim Person. And I'm Bob DeMarco. Welcome to the show. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. As you know, it is the place for knife newbies and knife junkies to learn all about knives and knife collecting and hear from knife designers, makers, manufacturers, reviewers, anybody who loves knives and is involved in the knife game. That's what we're all about here on the Knife Junkie Podcast. And uh, Bob, who is our uh, featured guest today? Uh, I'm speaking with Matthew Christensen of Christensen Knifeworks. Uh, you might know him from his collaborations with We, uh, the Critical or Alliance Designs, or now uh, We Knives, or you may know him for his uh, absolutely stunning uh, handmade custom work. Uh, so I'm really excited to get a chance to speak with him. All right. Well, that uh, is coming up uh, right after this uh, brief uh, self promotion, uh, uh, <laughs> sh- selfish, same, uh, if I can talk, selfish, um, shameless. That's the word I'm looking for. Or shameless self-promotion, want to uh, let you know that uh, you do need to go to the uh, Knife Junkie website. That's the knifejunkie.com slash books, the knifejunkie.com slash books. Go ahead and get your uh, pre-order for Knives 2021. That's the uh, book that's supposed to be coming out in October. You'll want to get that. And as you can see, lots of other books that you can uh, find on the knifejunkie.com slash books the knifejunkie.com slash books is the webpage that you want to get go to to find all the uh, the books about knives that you want to find. Have a knife you want featured or reviewed? Call the Knife Junkies 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487 and let us know. Matthew, welcome to the Knife Junkie podcast. Thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Oh, it's my pleasure. Uh, so I've been uh, following your work on Instagram for a couple of years and uh, and and kept my eye out when uh, when you first had a collaboration with Kaiser and uh, and then also uh, with Alliance. Uh, but recently, a uh, frequent contrib- contributor to our Thursday night show, Thursday Night Night, uh, Ryan uh, Spirited Blades, had you just know. gotten a misfit from you. And man, it knocked my socks off and everyone else. Um, so... Tell me how you got into custom knife making, and uh, apparently it started with pimping. Um, yeah, I mean, it It all starts from when you're a kid, you know. Um, I would say probably 12, 13. You know, I'm always, uh, my dad was in the military, and uh, he always had out the front, you know, stilettos and stuff like that. You know, and I was running his room and play with him growing up. Um, but, uh yeah, just all started from when I was younger, and my dad bought me my first knife and carried it religiously for a couple of years till it finally fell apart. You know, a lot of uh, wood carving and whatnot, but uh, it all it all led to, um, you know, to what it is is my knife pimping knife modding so i started collecting when i got a little older actually he passed away and um i started collecting more it was like a different hobby for me um i grew up racing motocross with him okay so when he passed i didn't like me and him were like always together so it was something else to get me you know my mind off of racing and you know, doing that because me and him and my brother were every weekend. Right. Hmm. So, um, after he passed and didn't really want to ride anymore. Cause you know, it just made me think of him. So, you know, started other things. I mean, did it all coincide? I don't know, but, uh, started collecting and then I seen videos on YouTube. Um, Jeff from, hmm. um, tough knives, um, tough thumbs. He just started modifying knives and you know i started getting to the you know higher end you know i would say you know higher hundred dollar knives that was high for me um when i first started Mm -hmm. and i just tried pimping and it just kind of led from there and you know you start one thing you got to start somewhere and then it just kind of leads to the other you know 
Yeah. It's like everything you do. You kind of want to go up the ladder. And uh, I got really good at doing that. So started making knives. Like, oh, I'm going to try to make my own, you know. Did a couple fixed blades. Nothing special. But that was kind of to the, you know, to the wayside. And, you know, whatever was fun or whatever I did. And started a YouTube channel doing the pimping and modding. It's not it's not available anymore unfortunately but uh something with uh hacking accounts and email so i had to delete the email or youtube but uh i still have all the videos i should pop them all up one day and start from there but you know i started getting pretty big in the customizing and pimping and you know and kind of went from there you know, uh, the customizing and, and pimping thing was really big for a while. And uh, it seems to have um, seems to have waned quite a bit. Uh, I, I remember thinking, like, why would you get a why would you get a, a production knife and then have someone customize it? Now I totally get it. Yeah. And uh, I'll have um, scales made or something like that. But why do you think the um, the whole knife modifying uh, game kind of trailed off a little bit? Uh, I wouldn't say it trailed off. It, if you really look, there's a probably a lot more modifiers than you, you know, hmm. you would expect. Maybe uh, it's my interest that trailed off. Yeah, it, it it can be. I mean, I don't really keep up with it, but I know a lot of guys that are still doing it, you know, on a daily basis. Hmm. Um, even with all like my Kaisers, um, there's a couple guys that bought hundreds of them just to modify them and sell them you know the the critical here because yeah. it's a you know it's a knife it's titanium and it has a lot of room for modifying and um they would do uh flipper deletes and everything like that so it's uh you know it it's not as big as it used to be i guess mm -hmm. but there are more people if that makes sense yeah yeah um because there's a lot more, I would say, production stuff that is already fancy or yeah. what you see is just, a, you know, a blade color change or like anodizing. Nothing like I was doing regrinds and um, full frame lock to, you know, or liner lock to frame lock conversions on, you know, Emerson's yeah. you know, doing that all the time. Oh, so, oh boys. So, you yeah. know, uh, to me, it made sense. Uh, for for instance, Jeff uh, Tough Thumbs, I've followed him and then sort of watched him uh, go into knife making. And it seemed to make sense. Uh -huh. uh, you know, you're already uh, changing handles. You're, all, you're already uh, customizing and modifying knives. You're learning how they work from a very intimate uh, perspective. Seems like the the jump to making knives is logical until you've ever ground a blade and then you see like that is a whole other part of it. You know, changing the handle and anodizing and all that's one thing, but grinding a blade is another. How did you make that jump? Um, well, it you you would think it'd be like simultaneous, like the same thing. It it is, but it isn't in the, in you know the the sense. Um, I would, because there was a lot to it when it came to modifying, you had to drill the holes in the right spot. You know, they, you had to, they had to match up. I, I think it's harder to modify a knife every once in a while, like some, depending on what it is, than to, you know, make a custom knife. And that may, without like the detent and, you know, the, you know, grinding and stuff. Um, Making the jump was more just just trying it. A lot of wasted materials, a lot mm -hmm. of, uh, you know, let me see if I could do it kind of thing. And just went from there. It was kind of, I've was i always been good with my hands. So some of these guys are starting making knives and they're like within six months to a year and they're just taking off with it. And it's, it's kind of crazy to think about it, but they're good with their hands. So it's, once you get the feel for some things, you know, it just kind of goes from there. And um, it was really early in Instagram and, you know, YouTube wasn't huge yet. It, I mean, it was, but it wasn't like it is now. Mm. Um, it's way different in, than it is now. But um, Instagram and these Facebook groups and everything like that 
have helped a lot of people, you know, jump from modifying to, you know, in, in making. Um, a lot of my stuff I did was I went from, you know, handles and then acid washing or, you know, that, that was really about it. And then ended up started regrinding, you know, it, it was scary at first. You didn't yeah. have to mess the couple up, you had to buy new knives, you know, good thing they were, you know, cheaper, um, well, cheaper to me now, but mm -hmm. there were some knives that I messed up that were two, three, four hundred dollars and well, there goes all my profit, but Hey, you know, do what you gotta do. So yeah, you um, learned how to regrind that knife the hard way, huh? Yeah. And you know, it just be beginner stuff. It's you look back on some of that stuff and I, I still kind of, you know, but you, you got to learn somewhere and uh, just went down the road, you know, step by step by step by step from regrinding to making friction friction folders made a lot mm -hmm. of friction folders i have uh, a lot of people overseas in uh, europe that bought a lot of friction folders for me and it was good practice there was no lockup or detent but it helped me design you know where a pivot and everything should line up thing and handle to blade ratios that kind mm -hmm. of thing yeah i love it i love designing like i'm on the computer three to four times a week just make i have so many designs on my computer it's ridiculous i just like so let me ask you this find different things go ahead is is designing in the computer for you like uh what sketching in a sketchbook with a pencil is to most people um, you know what? They all do it differently. I mean, my dad was a computer um, engineer, you know, he, he did CAD growing up and he designed chemical processing equipment. So it was pipes and everything. And I was always interested in, you know, computer drafting and 3D work. So I did all of that in high school, freshman, all the way through to uh, senior year. And the CAD work is like simple for me mm. i can make a knife and a whole working knife in 30 minutes yeah. and it, i know that it'll fit from me designing it to you know putting it on in steel some people like the older guys but you know they like to do the paper and you know drawing and sketching mm -hmm. some guys like to sketch out something first and see where they like it then they throw it in the computer I'm all computer. I used to sketch a lot when before, like I really started making. So I what's the hard stats. part of designing now? Um, aesthetics, really making sure it looks good. A lot of people learn about looks. Yeah. It's, you know, is it a, you know, good knife for this, that, whatever. But if it looks good, it functions good. It works good. Then it, you know, that's what people like. They like, you know, organic designs or this and that so but uh just getting it to work uh, around the pivot you know making sure everything fits together it's not a you know a tiny blade and a huge handle you know just making sure everything works and um i'd say that's like the biggest thing really you know but uh i mean it just fun it's that little you know, oh crap, I can't figure this out. You know, let's start over. It's easy just to drag and delete. Or yes. Drag yes. It over and start over, you know, instead of erasing and the whole thing's black and you can't really, you know, and then you got to cut stuff out. But some, like I said, some of the other, like, um, like Mark and the Maker guys, uh, Kendrick, Birch, all those guys, they can't do CAD work. They hate mm -hmm. it. But I mean, they rather design on paper. That is what it is. I mean, it's and we all we all do our thing. So, so when you're designing a knife, uh, I mean, I'm sure each time it's different. But say you, you're just sitting down, you know, you're going to design a knife. Do you think about the purpose of it first? Do you think about uh, the kind of blade you want first? How does that work? And I'm let's just more, say you're just you're on your own. This isn't a commission. I'm more of a. I want to do a small chubby knife today. Or I want to do a Persian. Or I, I, I get a lot of um, inspiration from 
other makers. You know, I it's oh man, that looks cool. That's a cool Persian or that's a cool Tonto. Well, I have a a Tonto already. You know, let me let me go make something like that. But you know, obviously they're not going to copy, but you know that kind of thing. It's a lot of it goes from like blade shape for me. Um, and then I just build off that, whatever works. Um, some of them are just want to be weird and, you know, it's just whatever yeah. comes out half the time. Oh, I kind of like that. And then I show a couple people, oh, that's really cool. Well, change this. And I change that. And, you know, that's the good thing about social media. Now you're connected to so many people. Yeah. Like, um, I know I always message you on Instagram, but I'm like Instagram and Facebook and Facebook messenger. I will take a picture of my computer, send it off to my buddy or a group that I'm in, like a, a chat group. And oh, I like that, like that, like that, change this. And then I change it. And, you know, it's kind of like a collab of, I guess you could say. Yeah. But I have so many, like, I could probably make one a week for a whole year. I would, and it'd be, it, it's ridiculous. So. I mean, I think I think it's amazing what you're talking about um, social media. It seems like so many knife careers have started um, thanks to social media. And the fact that you can, like you said, be so nimble with feedback from your customers and from, you know, people who care. Uh, to me, uh, you know, you're talking about blade shape and you're talking about some of these things like the Brutus to me is a, uh, a strange looking knife. And then you look at the Misfit, which has almost all the same properties, but just in different uh, proportions. And to me, that is the most, <laughs> oh my God, that knife is so beautiful. You actually think about it. Yeah. Like if you take a Brutus and you just shrink it down and stretch it out a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, they all, so I all started, they all started from my little Brute. Um, so the Brute was my first design that I designed. Um, that wasn't like a collab. I started off doing knives with uh, Alpha Hunter Tactical. You yeah. familiar with him? So yes, and I remember the Sinbad very yeah, well. So that knife Sinbad. was so cool. So I designed that on paper. <clears throat> I sketched all that. And I had um, David Curtis, uh, Curtis Knives, help with design, like, make it work, because I was mm. newer to it. That was, like, my first folding knife was the, the Sinbad. It's a crazy knife, but if you think about it, so I started drawing everything off that pivot and off that lock. And I just made a little stubby knife. I liked the little thing. It looked like a shark. I'm very fascinated. Yeah. Not many people know this. Like it's, I wouldn't say hardly anyone. But when I was younger, I loved sharks. Love them. Love great white. Used to, you know, um, uh, always when we went to the library, I always got the same three shark books. Right? Yeah, me too, man. I mean, that that was yeah. my childhood too. <clears throat> I loved it. So, I mean, I don't think about it that much now. But when I was designing it, I seen it. It looked like a little stubby, you know, great white shark. I thought it was awesome. So let's go with it. But it, it all pivoted around the same pivot that I used for the Sinbad. And I started drawing off that, you know, and then I started designing a little off that more. So then you got um, the Brute and then the Brutus came along was a, it was a Sinbad that I chopped down. So I made it super small. So I took a Sinbad blade and I just like chopped it down because the pivot and the stop were all the same as the Brute and the Sinbad. Uh, yeah. So I was like, oh, let me see what I can do with this blade. And I, you know, chopped it up and it worked. And I'm, hey, to my buddy, does this look cool? Yeah, it looks cool. I was like, ah, it's kind of weird. But I posted it anyways, posted on my uh, Instagram. And everyone went nuts. They went crazy. <laughs> so I'm like, oh, I guess I'll start making them. Because I had a lot of uh, blades like left over from the collab mm -hmm. that uh, it was over with. So we didn't do any more. I didn't have any more handles. But I had a lot of brute handles. So um, went on from there. And, you know, everything is drawn from the same um, pivot area. And then I designed the critical. And then four or five more were designed or, you know, designed from the critical pivot area. And then I designed other ones and, you know, they kind of just break off into branches and how style, my style changes throughout the years, uh -huh. or like, you know, how I feel, you know, so 
So in a way, the you you sort of figure out the pivot. Okay, uh, if you could stop right there, Jim. That uh, the knife in the in the dead center. That's the one I'm talking about. I think yeah. that's the one you may have made for Ryan. It is. Um, yep. God, I I just man, that knife is just so beautiful. That everything about it, and and not for nothing, but you do a beautiful hand rub. Um, he was showing that up in in close up uh, on one of our shows. Um, just a just a beautiful knife. Um, so. You mentioned uh, Dave Curtis of Curtis Knives. He's kind of a legend in the in the modern uh, tactical folding titanium frame lock world. For sure. um, how, so how did you get hooked up with him, and and w what did he teach you? So I um, was friends with um, Chad of Hunter Tactical, right. and David Curtis was he water jetted parts. All I knew him was that he water jet parts. But at the time I didn't know he made like a frame lock, which is the F3 um, at the time. So I was like, like I said, I just getting into like custom stuff or, you know, higher end, you know, knives. So I wasn't really familiar with him. So I did a little research, found out he's only like two hours away, not too far. Um, started talking. He cut all my parts for the Sinbad. Hmm. Went down there, I uh, wanted to meet him, you know, pick up the parts, you know, it was easier that way. It's, you know, hey, I want to see how you are, meet you, I want to see your knives. I'm like new to it. So, so went there and um, really cool guy right out of his garage, like two and a half or a three car garage or whatever it was. He had a water jet, he had three grinders, you know, and a bunch of drill presses lined up. That's all he had. And, you know, heat treat oven, you know, that's, that's about it. And uh, I was like, you do all this in here? And uh, I was like, man, I'm thinking that we're going to have a big shop. And, you know, I didn't expect something that small. So it kind of clicked in my head. It's like, man, I could do more than what I am. Hmm. Out of, you know, I was working out of an old back room of my mom's house. And, you know, it just kind of went from there. And then I moved out here where I'm at now. And I was like, oh, I got a three-car garage. Might as well, you know, do my thing. So started talking to him, became friends. He actually, when I was there, he showed me how he cut cut, cut his locks and did his detent. And I was there, everything was together. And uh, he goes, well, you touch this one, so I can't I can't sell it. And he gave me an F3, first F3. Year. Yeah, so. Oh, man. We kind of became friends at that time. So uh, <laughs> um, I said, hey, if you ever need help with anything, um, weekends or anything i would love to come down and work for you i mean free apprentice yeah whatever so i'd say a year or two later um he started he was cutting my parts still so he, he cut my my brute and everything like that i was working at home so i had a daytime job and i would come home and work a couple hours and work here and then i ended up losing my job and i was like hey dave remember when i said you need help do you need like full-time help <laughs> but yet again i said it, he two hours he's like 99.5 miles from my house wow. it's a hike yeah but i said hey I, i'm worth it. um you know it's worth it to me to learn a little bit and i eventually want to start building full-time are you okay with me, you know, working for you until I want to like jump into it full time? He said, yeah, come down. So, I mean, he's taught me a lot of tips and tricks that I would never have thought of. And I'm like, man, I could have did that, man. I could have did that. You know, when I threw knives away and like, it, he helped me a lot. He helped me with uh, design stuff and bearings and setting locks and detents. And I've changed things throughout the years, but, if it wasn't for him, I probably wouldn't be where I'm at. I mean, it's hard to say that, but I mean, he is a good guy. So he, he helped me with the, Hey, just start assembling and just learn like, um, troubleshoot things. So went on from there and just, we became friends. We haven't talked in a, in a while. Um, every once in a while we'll chat, but I mean, I see him at the shows and whatnot, but 
He's a uh, he's old school. Doesn't really like talking on the phone and social media. Oh, that is old school. <laughs> the so, telephone. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, well, he, I'm saying like he just doesn't like talking. Yeah, you know, yeah. he just wants to do his thing. And all right, what do you want? What do you want? You know, that kind yeah. of thing. So, well, one thing that really struck me is is um, you know I, I can't. I, I know that this has happened in my life is just seeing how someone else does something and how, how it can, how seeing what Dave Curtis was producing out of his garage, just obliterated your um, expectations of what you were going to see. And you, all you saw was a garage and some, a little bit, you know, more machines than you had. And you realize this is scalable. You know, I don't have to have, you know, a huge production facility. That's just an excuse. You know, I can start making these things now. Well, people do like they start with the littlest things. And I recommend three things when you start, maybe four, a nice grinder, a good drill press and a Dremel. Dremel is key. It's like people think, oh, Dremel, really? Get in the little spots here and there. You just need a good grinder, a good drill press and a Dremel and you'll be set. That's all you need. Literally. What was the fourth thing you said? Maybe four. I said maybe four, uh, like a buffing wheel or something like that. I but know. that's that's really all you would really need. I'll tell you the truth. Yeah. What about I heat mean, treat? Do you heat treat your own stuff or? Or I would say like a nice, uh, like a I do heat treat my own stuff. You could send that out though. I used to send no. it out for years, um, like a bandsaw, something that could cut metal, like a okay. a good metal bandsaw if you get it. I just use a. A porta band with a metal table. Oh yeah, yeah. So that's all I use, and uh, that's all you really need. So, do you? How much do you have? Like, what is your process now? You've, you've, um, uh, from the looks of it, you know, you've, you've got a steady clientele. You have a steady output. Um, are you having your parts cut out, water jetted, and and well, like, what does your process look like? Yeah. So. Only thing I do that's outsourced now is, you know, buy parts, like materials, obviously, and uh, water jet. So I water jet to, you know, keep my times down and gives me more time to, you know, do other things. And I get a knife done a little faster. Um, but that's the only outsourcing I do is pivots and whatnot, you know, the hardware. And then uh, I'll have uh, Chris Dunn at Top top Done top done jets um he works for chad nichols Mm -hmm. which if i buy all my material there it goes right over to chris dunn top done jets he'll water jet it i send my files over he gets it done and sends me a package of parts so i mean the process is that and then you know a lot of blades go straight into heat treat so i do all that all my milling you know i did do pretty much everything else after that so um do you like having um it seems like when you have that done everything that you get is very universal and and um you know is there some freedom in having all the same parts to work with you're making all the same model of knife but you're doing it by hand and i would imagine that starting with everything being the same must be a good thing i don't know Um, is is there some utility in that i mean yes and no i mean i it does save me time and I know what I'm looking forward to, or I know I'm getting myself into when I start a knife. Mm -hmm. Um, Some people start from scratch still. I mean, it's a sheet, a template, and they do everything by hand. Well, they've done it that way for how long. And that's just what they're used to. Same with me. I've started with Dave Curtis cutting my parts and that's what I'm used to. Can I, can I make a knife from start to finish? you know, cutting my lock bars. Of course, I've done it. But it's just what I'm used to, what I like, and, you know, it's simple to me. It's yeah. It saves me that much more. It t- saves me almost a day of work, if you think about it. Cutting it out from a piece of steel or titanium, you know, lock bars. And it seems, like, it seems like there's no uh, expression in that part of the process, unless, unless your ultimate uh, expression is the engineering of it. Uh-huh. seems like that's kind of like, uh, let's get this part out of the way so I can focus on this amazing blade grind and this yeah. amazing handle. 
And when it comes to water jet parts, they're all the same. So mm-hmm. you get the same knife almost. Um, when it comes to if you want a, a misfit, you're getting a misfit. You're not getting a misfit with a little lock bar, longer lock bar, yeah. this, that. It's you they're easier for me to make because I know what I'm doing. I know what I'm getting myself into. It isn't a I cut my lock bar too far or I cut it too thick, you know, that kind of thing, or I'm off a little bit here. I just the parts are already done, so so l- let me ask you this. What do you design your knives for? And I I, I ask you this because everyone sees things differently. And I look yeah. at the misfit. And to me, that's just a, that's a terrifying, menacing, uh, beautiful little beast. Uh, but, but I'm quite sure that the one person I know who has one didn't buy it for that reason. He bought it for something totally different. So uh, in your mind, uh, the, the person making and designing your knives what are you after? What are you going after? Um, what do you like really mean? by? I mean, like, what are you designing these knives for? Uh, obviously they're beautiful and obviously they're useful. Um, I look, I look at them and I think, Ooh, beautiful weapon. Other people yeah. look at them and say, Ooh, beautiful tool. You know, a lot of my stuff's EDC friendly, you know, um, not necessarily like hard use or anything like that. Honestly, it's more of it's what I like. I mean, it's I'm not necessarily like let's just say like my new one I'm doing. So the thug, mm. it's you know, yeah. I've made one custom of this. What is this used for? Well, it fits in the pocket, nice. All right, as a little tanto, yeah, you can stab things. But if you tilt, you'll tilt again. You have a tip here, cut. You have a really sharp tip, but then you have a, a slight recurve. Mm-hmm. You think about it, but it's stubby, so it's not super thin. If you want to stab something, you probably could. A lot of it is just what I. It looks cool. I mean, to be honest, yeah, I'm yeah. not. I'm not making a fixed blade. Something like, I mean, I do have some that are made for, you know, fixed blade pocket carry, you know, that kind of thing. Um, like the let's say the Brutus, what are you gonna use that for? Yeah. <laughs> Chop some onions. Just I mean, looking it, cool. <laughs> it just looks cool. And I, I mean, be honest, there are guys like Tom Crine makes a killer fixed blade for what he does. Every design he makes mm-hmm. is for a certain thing. Yeah. And there's nothing wrong with that. But if you think about it, look at his folder. It's a BDC folder. Cut your. It's a cool box opener no offense i'm not i'm not you know that's everything that i do they're cool yeah yeah. i i I, yeah 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 i i mean you gotta you gotta be big enough to admit that half of i mean i've spent a lot of money on knives and so much of it is up here on the surface shallow you know uh i get them because i like them and i like to you know yeah i mean when it comes to i would say Folding knives are light use, but you have to like them. Yeah. Some people want one to be a dressy, you know, something that you could carry while you're going to a wedding or something like that. Or, you know, at work, something light and small. Something big just because they like, they want to feel manly, you know, a big chopper. But you're only cutting your mail open. You know, like, right. <laughs> I don't ever see... You know, unless you have a a butterfly knife or, you know, a backpacking fixed blade or something like that. I mean, a folder to me is just pocket jewelry that you, you know, you use in your every day, you know, that kind of thing. So the thug, uh, that's the knife you were just holding up. Yeah. Beautiful, beautiful little knife. And so this is a collaborative. How does this work? This is a wee knife. Is is this something, a, a design they licensed from you? Or is so, this under your shingle? How does that work? So this is like the Kaiser. So this is an OEM. They're producing this. So it'll be sold from them. Um, I designed this last year sometime as a, as a custom. And uh, I was like, man, all these production knives I do 
are big. Yeah. So that's a CKF. That's nice. Custom Knife Factory Spectra. Super fancy. Kaiser Critical. It's big. They're big knives. Yeah. Um, the littlest one I did was, you know, the Bangarang. This is a yeah. small Bangarang. It's still kind of big. And I started off making small knives. So this is a little bit bigger than the Brute. So that knife there, I decided, you know what? I like it. Let's see if we will pick it up. So I contacted him. Hey, I have these knives, you know, through Kaiser and whatever. I would like a production knife. Because only production I have, quotes production, like mm-hmm. mass produced, is the Kaiser Critical. And that hasn't been updated in like three years. Right. I've been, I'm, we are doing a small it should be out any like prototype should be here within a couple weeks i hope uh so a small critical from kaiser um but i like we i like the guys over there i, I have a lot of friends that design for them mm-hmm. so i was like you know what let's see if i hit up david's son works for them that's how i got into kaiser he used to work for kaiser I said hey i know you guys aren't doing uh, any production stuff but i don't have the time and money to do an OEM run. Would would you guys put this in your lineup? You know, to produce it. You know, I wanted a lower end, but something for me and all my friends could buy. You know. Yes. Yeah. You know, my goal my goal is to get into a USA production company like, let's say like Kershaw. And get something at the forty dollar, sixty dollar mark that all my friends could buy. Yeah, that'd be cool. You know, that's like goal for me because they always want a knife for me. I'm like, you don't want one of these. Like, no, I would love to sell you one, but you don't want a it's just trouble. Knife. It's just gonna take you down a dark path, man. Well, I have a buddy, so I bought a Sabenza for my buddy, and uh, he had it. Well, he lost it. I'm like, well, you're gonna here's here's a cheap knife. So I gave him a a Boker, um, what the heck's his name? Ah, man, I can't think of it. Super skinny, long. Boker. Oh, uh, uh, the the bones, the um, no, it's the Urban Trapper. B a B yeah B Z uh. Oh yeah, the Brad Zinker Urban Zinker, Trapper. Zinker. So yeah, I got it. I got a Boker, whatever. I say here, keep this. It's small. It's thin. You won't lose it. He lost it in three days. Oh. I said, and now you want a custom for me? <laughs> Imagine losing a thousand dollar knife, bud. You know. Dude. So I've given out a couple of lines designs, you know, bang rings to a friend, a couple friends. I think four of them, five of them, you know, to people. That aren't knife guys, but they want something from me. Yeah, yeah. So, with this new Wii, I was hoping it was smaller. Everyone wanted something smaller. Everything I've done has been bigger and chunkier. You know, the cool little hidden lanyard hole. Yeah, that is beautiful. Lanyard pin. Thought that was cool. Let me uh, see the the blade again. So you were you were talking about the blade, and you, what you forgot to mention, you know, it does have that straight that straight like little slight recurve it's got the two points but it's also got that beautiful belly up front it's a very yes. very useful looking blade but it doesn't surrender just because it's small and utilitarian it doesn't surrender that essential menace that uh all knives should have you know yeah i mean it looks mean yeah for how small it is it just fits good in the hand surprisingly you know for a small little knife and it fits great in the pocket i mean i lost it the other day i found it what's the what's the (laughs) blade length on that it's 2.75 2.75 and and when can we expect those to be uh, on shelves virtual shelf my email today from them was they are they hit the go button to get produced so sweet whenever that is a month two months three months i don't i'm not 100%. 100%. Hopefully it's sooner than later. Um, mm-hmm. But hopefully it's soon. But I mean, I'll let everyone know and, you know, I'll be. Yeah, yeah. Um, so one thing, so I got these to 
check off the list and uh and then with the Kaiser Kaiser Critical we're making a small version production and these are I should have a prototype within the next week or two. That, that those be- are going to those are going to go crazy. I I, yeah, I love sure. the Critical. I think a lot of people like that knife. Um unlike me, I think a lot of people like the smaller uh the smaller things. So I think it'll it'll uh I mean it'll jump off the shelves. Yeah, I mean Everything I've done has been big. Same with like the Spectra. I mean, it's just a bigger knife. Yeah. People are like, man, it's too big. All right. So that's why I make all my customs. I make two sizes. I make a small and a large. Unless it's super thin and it's a small knife already. I won't make a small. You know, I have a misfit. I do have a small misfit coming out. So so I, I try to I try to like I have a small Brutus, a medium Brutus, and a large Brutus. Or a big Brutus, which it's a big cleaver. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I try to fit everyone's liking, if that makes sense. Well, uh, to fit my liking, I think you need to make a, a misfit uh, collaboration knife so I can get one. Uh, <laughs> uh, I mean, you could too, but you'd be waiting a little bit, unfortunately. It, it seems like the collaborations are working. They work well for you. Uh, uh, I didn't even realize that you had the the one with um, Custom Knife Factory out of Russia. Um, I actually, yeah, I have two designs. So it's the same model. Okay. The other one is, uh, I don't have one. I gave it to a friend, unfortunately. Um, and he lost it. <laughs> Son of a... Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. So oh, no, I meant he, your friend he, lost the knife uh, you loaned him. <clears throat> no, unfortunately not that one. It was just a, it's a... Um, what is it called? A bolster lock. So it was a tie and then carbon fiber on both sides. And then it had a, like a, a Tonto style blade with a hole. Okay. So it's different. This one was a super fancy with Timascus and damascus steel. Jeez. But yeah, so I had two versions of it. So, and it's, they're super smooth. So the collaborations uh, seem to suit you well. Do you want to keep doing this? Like, how do you, how do you see yourself moving into the future? Um, so I have a couple more. Like, it's fun. I mean, it's decent money for me. Like, it brings in some revenue for you know not really doing much. I mean, I still do a lot because it's my design. Um, but I want to. If I move forward, it'll be a knife that I don't make. So the thug, I will make two more customs and that's it. So that'll be it for the thug customs. And then it'll just be straight production. Um, I'd like to do that or even do like small runs of the OEM stuff. You know, when I get some, you know, money together and go from there. But um, I mean, they're fun. I mean, I like to see a lower end, something that someone wants and they, in the beginning, everyone's like, oh, it's going to hurt your sales. It's going to hurt this, hurt that. It's going to, you know, lower everything. And I haven't seen that. Mm-hmm. I haven't seen any production stuff lower my, you know, secondary or anything like that. So, well, what's your favorite part of the process? Um, I would say getting the first one in hand. I'm excited to see how they come out. And uh, getting people, get them in people's hands and get everyone's reviews and all oh, these are cool. These are awesome. You know, I mean, yeah. that's, that's the best part of even making custom knives. Okay. Cause that's actually what I was getting at. I meant, I meant when you're building a knife handmade, oh, okay. uh, what is the part of the, of the building process or the designing? You know, what part before it goes out the door, are you the, are you the happiest and in, in doing what you're doing? When it's done, <laughs> when it's done, uh, when it's done, and the customer's happy, like that's the biggest thing for me. I'm a, I'm a giver. I love giving things. I hate getting gifts. You know, I haven't. You know, I hate Christmas. I hate my birthday. You know, bah humbug, whatever. But <laughs> you know, I love giving things to people and then making people happy. So if, even though you're giving me money, I can't wait to see how much you love this knife and if you hate it i hate it so i try my best to make it you know you know make it better but the joy like some of these guys like go above and beyond like let's just say ryan he loves his misfit yeah i mean but there's other people that have 
five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten of my knives because they just love what it is and you know we're friends. So I like knives bring joy to people, cars bring joy to people, shoes bring joy to people. So when they get a new knife for me and they love it, that makes me happy. Yeah. Especially if they've gotten to know you at all, too. I yes. mean, I, I I think that that adds to it. Um, you know, it it's got to. Um, yeah, but I mean, that's funny. I mean, like, uh, sorry to interrupt, but you're talking about yeah. making something and then releasing it into the world. And uh, I've done a lot of that with uh, paintings and drawings. But who knows? I don't know if those are up on any walls anymore. They might be, you know... Uh, they might they may have turned to dust in all these years but you know for sure that your knives are not turning to dust and they might get lost but they're somewhere and they're usable yeah for sure and to me that's got to be an amazing feeling i mean it is um, the worst feeling is the person gets it and they hate it or i have a bad review or i did i missed something on the knife you know that that's like it's like a shot to the heart or someone We'll buy it and sell it right away. It's like, man, I put all my work into it. I was hoping you like it, you know, and it doesn't come out that way. So do you follow, uh, do you follow the life of a knife after it leaves your shop? You know what? In the beginning I tried, you know, I do, I do know where probably 90% of them are. Mm -hmm. um, just <laughs> like if you showed me the knife, I'd be like, well, that person has it. He might've sold it. Or I know he sold it. If it's like newer, um, the older stuff is kind of, you know, some guys have knives and they just go low key and sell them. And I don't know who has it, you know, that kind of thing. Or like, they're not social media guys. Mm -hmm. uh, you never see it. So there's, there's knives out there that I'm like, see you, buddy. I'll never see you again, you know, because I know that I met him at a show and it's, through emails and they're not on any and he's not taking his pocket knife out and taking pictures yeah, and posting it no no you'll <laughs> never see it but i mean i know they're enjoying it because i haven't heard anything back you know or so what do you in the market what do you hear back um from people besides oh my god i love this this thing's amazing like what, what are people using your knives for and what kind of experiences are they having with these things you know what i have a lot of a lot of friends from everywhere, you know, uh, hunters, you know, all across the world. And like anyone, anyone that really has a pocket knife, they just carry it and use it hunting or open their mail or take pictures with their watches, you know, that kind of thing. Um, I try like try my best to be friends with everyone that I've ever, you know, sold knives to. So I'll get pictures here and there and, there's some cool ones and there's some, all right, it's just, you know, regular standard everyday EDC, you know, take a picture of my wallet and my, you know, my pocket dump kind of thing. Um, but yeah, I mean, I just enjoy everything about knives. If that makes sense. It's stressful. I mean, the most stressful part is when I ship it out you know, making sure that it gets there and they enjoy it. If they don't like it, man, that they like said that that hurts like, or, you know, that there's an issue with it and I missed or something like that. So what, uh, what's the knife game like? That's what I thought you were going to get to when you said stressful, uh, you were talking about stress of someone liking or not liking your work, but yeah. what about the stress of being a small business owner in this very niche, uh, industry? It is. I mean, it is very stressful and I'm not a, good business person i guess you could say um most knife makers aren't unless you're older and you kind of know ins and outs i kind of jumped into this and you know that that's a lot of stress there a lot of money and you know am i gonna be able to pay my bills it's not a you know it's like any art really uh you know your own business so it's it's hard to know what money's coming in and what money's going out, you know, that kind of thing. That is very stressful. Um, but I enjoy it. I'm learning. I'm still young. I've made mistakes, but I've changed them and, you know, trying to make it, you know, smoother as I go along. And the stress, the stressful part is, is, well, next year, are people going to buy my knives? Are they mm. going to like them? Uh, you know, that kind of thing. So, 
That's that is an interesting um, thing. I mean, we're talking about knives that have been around since the dawn of of uh, humanity, but we have seen you know over and over trends and knife designs almost left looking dated. You know, several yeah, sure. years later, which is nuts. I mean, it's, it's kind of crazy to think about. But then again, you look back through a history book of weapons, and they're they're all dated. You look at that. Oh, that's a Spanish knife from the uh, 17th century. It's all For dated, sure. but but how quickly things get dated now is is pretty hilarious. Um, Materials and design, like shapes, yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's all it all I, changes. It changes a lot. I think you were actually one of the people to um, bring the Warncliffe to the fore. I mean, people like like there was a Warncliffe craze going on right around the time the Critical came out, and uh, you know, I before. Uh, before that period of time, I, I I thought they were unsightly. You know, I did not like Warren Cliffs. And then something something clicked, and it was probably uh, part you know, part partially your design work yes, out sir. there. I I've always loved the Warren Cliff design. Um, that that still is one of my favorites. I I could kind of drift off other ones now now and then. Um, but still, like the Yojimbo, Spider Co. Yojimbo mm. used to be my favorite design. It's funky, it's weird, but I like straight edge knives. I don't know why. Um, but I did a lot of friction folders with straight edge. You know, they're easier to grind. Um, you know, it's a straight edge. You can't really, you don't have to sweep your grinds or anything like that. Um, it, I wouldn't say easier because it's harder to keep straight. It makes sense. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> so, but, uh, I mean, I just always love them. And when it comes to, sorry, my, my dog's uh, dreaming over here. He's barking in his dream. Uh, <laughs> Go get him. Right. He's running. But uh, yeah, I just always loved Warren Cliff. So when I, when I did the brute and then I didn't want to design the, you know, the critical, I was like, well, my favorite knife design is, you know, a Warren Cliff, let me try to make it not look ugly because a lot of them are weird. They all, well, they're made for like, a, you know, personal protection. You know, that's, I believe that's most Warren Cliffs are. Um, and I wanted to make something that just kind of was thin and smooth and look cool. So, you know, just kind of went from there. A lot of sketches on that one. That was, that was still my, uh, my drawing days, mm -hmm. you know. I have probably have like eight or nine sheets of Warren Cliff sketches just to come out with the critical. Just so. to get it, everything looking just right. So you, yeah. you, you, you had the, uh, you had the um, privilege isn't the right word. You had the good fortune of working with Alpha Hunter Tactical and, you know, working closely with Dave Curtis. Do you see yeah. yourself in the future? Um, lending that kind of hand or mentorship to someone coming up and also what would you tell anyone listening who has uh, designs on uh, becoming a knife maker you know what I, I i do help people all the time um a lot of it's through social media a lot of it's through um you know texting and video not necessarily people at the shop i have a couple friends that i've you know helped um when some of them are like, hey, can you help me with this? Or, hey, can you help me with that? It isn't like I'm teaching anyone. I don't think I've ever taught anyone. Mm -hmm. I mean, I would love to when I get time. And it's a, like, they want to do it because they love knives. I've had a couple people want to do it just because they think they can make money at it. And I'm like, yeah, no, you know what? You're in it for the wrong reason. You need to love knives, and you just want to learn how to make one, not mm -hmm. because you want to make money off of it. Yeah, so many other things. To... Yeah, uh, I mean, you have to like, uh, oh, can I make a knife? Uh, I've, I've had a couple when I was younger, blah, blah, blah. But if you have design, hey, just, you know, hit someone up, like newer maker. These guys hit me up all the time. Hey, how do you do this? Or, or do it this way. Or, hey, text me next week. Or text me later and I'll help you when I'm in the shop. You know, and I'll show you how I do it. Growing up, I really, 
when I first got into the knife making, I didn't have that. And I had, you know, David Curtis helped, but I wish I had the social media Mm -hmm. and the people reaching out or I could reach out to them. Um, There was forums, but they're all, they were all stuck up and they really didn't want to help you. You know, hey, where do you get this? Google it. You know, (laughs) thanks. Okay, whatever. Like that was USN and, you know, blade forums and all that. And uh, so I just kind of winged it. And then I started, you know, working with Dave and he's like, here's how you do this, this and this. And that's kind of where it, you know, took off. But don't be scared to hit up a maker or, you know, just be like, hey, I have an issue with this or where can I start? Where can I buy this? Where can I get this? The worst we could say is no or, you know, get out of here. But a lot of knife makers are just normal, everyday people. We like knives. We like drinking beers. We like hanging out. And we like helping everyone. You know, let's. No one's the competition. Like, when it comes to knife making, like, I don't think of it as competition. A lot of us do collabs together. Yeah. So we know that my market is different than his market, and his market. It's different than mine or vice versa, you know, and if someone has one of his knives, they more than likely have one of mine. So why not put them together and sell them, you know, yeah. get more people over it. We're not, it's like having like uh shoes. You don't only have one brand, or, yeah. you know, or clothes like shirts or anything like that. And you know They're what? Those spread out. Those collaboration knives are so exciting when you see two uh, awesome knife makers coming together and you can just look at, oh, I know where that that jimping came from so-and-so and and that blade, low, that handle is definitely, and you get to break it down. I love that. Uh, The knife you did with Brian Efros was gorgeous, Uh, the the jive. I love love that. And when I hit him up and said, hey, I love this design. Can I do it? Yeah, go for it, you know? So how do do people... Well, oh yeah, I want to. I'd love to talk to to him. I think his knives are gorgeous. Uh, how do people get your knives? Um, do you have books? How can people reach well, out to you and and get? I don't necessarily have books now. I'm pretty backed up on stuff. Uh, I try my best to fit in some dealers and get them out there or a lot of on my page. So it'd be uh, my Instagram. You can hit me up on my Instagram or uh, Facebook. And then my Facebook group is um, Christensen Knife Works, C10s and dogs. A lot of uh, a lot of my truck and dogs and everyone posting dogs because hey, that's what that's what my life is is knives, my dog and my truck. So hey, if you want to post your do- your your car and your dog and a knife, I'm I'm happy with that. <laughs> so, uh, um, so yeah, production stuff. Uh, Alliance Designs has some of the bangerang still there there's you know a handful left of them um kaiser is always out there and the Wii will be in production here shortly so man i you look at look into them but uh getting a knife for me you just gotta be patient there's a lot of secondary sales on my page um there's always one up for sale some some, somewhere in there like instagram you know, I always, uh, someone has something for sale. I always tag it and, uh, repost it oh, that's into cool. my feed. Um, cause if it sells, it's good for me. People don't like, well, I can't sell it if I need to. Yeah. So I just try to help it out kind of thing. And like I said, I try to be friends with all my customers. I'm just a normal guy that make knives, you know? So, and that's, that's an, going back to that, like shows. I absolutely lo- love shows The knives and the money are, are there but i love seeing everyone like i miss it this year because covid but man i i just love seeing everyone hanging out and just talking like community that's my favorite all about the community and all the clicks are different but we're like all the same in the same way you know there's tactical guys and there's you know strider guys only do like production only do customs only do this only do that yeah. but we all come together in one way and we just love it all you know and i've it's... met 
like I was telling Ryan when I was, when I met him for the first time, met him um, in person, I was like, I know you better. I won't say I would know you, but I've met people in the knife community that I call friends better than some of my actual friends. Yeah. Because it's like, we talk more where we communicate more. Like it just, it's something else. I just, I just love the community. I mean, there's, you know, some, you know, assholes here and there, but yeah, you know, well, that's everything, you know, but exactly. uh, you got, you got to love it. So, but going back to like anyone that needs help, just, just reach out the best thing you can do. And I mean, that's what well, we're there for. You can't, and, you can't, you can't, uh, uh, put on the, uh, the generation of new knife makers if they're not learning, you know? So, so or, anyone who's listening, take advantage. You just heard <laughs> the man, Matthew Christensen say yeah, it's all right. about the community and he wants to help. So I mean, I'll, for help, sure. I'll help as much as I can. So Matthew, thank you so much for coming on the knife junkie podcast. It's been a pleasure finding out a little bit more about you. Uh, the man behind the beautiful knives. And uh, well, we look forward to uh, seeing a lot more from you. I, for one, am really looking forward to the thug. It seems to hit a lot of uh, check almost every single box for me, except the large box. And I like it because it's not large. So there you go, man. Hey. Every, every box. <laughs> hey, you, you might like it. It, might, it melts in your hand. So it uh, looks beautiful. I appreciate that. Thanks for having me. My pleasure, sir. Take care. Thanks. Have a good one. Do you use terms like handle the blade ratio, walk and talk, hair pop and sharp, or tank like? Then you are a dork and a knife junkie. I love that one. A dork. A dork. <laughs> yes. Yeah, Thank you. Junkie. That's me. <laughs> Bob the dork knife junkie. Yeah. Hey, uh, cool interview. I uh, what was your uh, key takeaway? I've got uh, I've got one that really uh, kind of stuck with me, but I'll let you go first. Oh, I mean, to me, I mean, aside from how uh, how appealing his knives are, just to look at them, and and I know at some point I'll handle one and I'll say the same thing, but uh, I'm I'm really struck just by how much the community means to Matthew, and and how much uh, the the brotherhood and sisterhood of dorks like us who love knives and talk right. handle the blade ratio are, and you know, he he was just talking about how the how you know the knife world for him started as kind of an escape and uh in a way it seems like it might still be and what a, what a beautiful escape indeed yeah that was that was one point and then the other point i had was uh i think it's probably the first interview that we've had uh that someone has been intentional about the uh lower price point uh, you know, that 40, the 50, the $60 range yeah. being intentional about creating knives in that price point, which, uh, which really kind of struck me. Yeah. Yeah. Me too. Um, especially like it, what struck me there is now that's a knife lover who became uh, a knife maker, um, yeah. uh, like a knife collector guy who understands the plight of the knife collector guy. Right. Know? Right. And making knives for his friends, right. Who don't want yeah. custom knives, just want to want a knife. Yeah. Right, exactly. That they can lose two weeks later. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> get another one. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, a, mon a monumental uh, way to uh, end the month of uh, September with the interview shows, uh, episode number 150. Uh, kind of a milestone for the Knife Junkie podcast on our way to uh, 200 and beyond. Uh, don't forget to uh, join us Wednesday for the midweek uh, uh, podcast episode. And of course, Thursday night at uh, 10 p.m. for Thursday Night Knives that you can catch on YouTube and on the Knife Junkies Facebook page. So going to wrap it up for today, but thank you so much truly for joining us here on the Knife Junkie podcast for the uh, guy with the, uh, uh, the uh, what, two-day growth there? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Mine would be like five weeks and I'd look like that. But uh, <laughs> the mountain man off the mountain, Mr. Uh, knife Chunky himself, Bob DeMarco. I'm the knife newbie Jim person thing. Thanks for joining us on the Knife Chunky podcast. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for listening to the Knife Chunky podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. 
For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear Hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. 